welcome to this week's episode of the Artist Collective Radio Show. I am your host, Shoshana Pearson. I'm so glad that you could join me today because I am super excited about my guest on this week's episode. I met Frank Cayetti in 2016 when I was taking an intensive improv class from him at the Second City LA. I was so impressed with his improv skills and his physical comedy, but I was mostly impressed by his genuine interest and care and kindness for his students. Frank has a long history of yes anding his way through life which has garnered him roles on shows like Modern Family, NCIS, Reno 911, and even as a cast member on Mad TV, among many others. In this week's episode, we find out where Frank gets his comedic inspiration, how he balances it all with his life at home, and what he's working on right now. So stick around and stay tuned, and don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel so I can keep bringing you intimate conversations with your favorite artists. So sit back, relax, and let's check in with Frank. Hi, Frank. Thank you so much for joining me, taking some time out of your busy travel schedule to join me here on the Artist Collective radio show. I'm so excited to have you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Okay, so tell me how you got started in this wacky world of comedy. Did you always do comedy? Have you always been a funny person? Was it always your thing for creative expression? Or tell me how this came to be. Um, the answer, I was not necessarily always a performer. I think I always liked to laugh and make my friends laugh. But I was not like a kid who was a performer, like, okay, Frankie's going to put on a show, everyone come in the living room. Like, I wasn't that kid at all. I was uh, busy outside playing and playing sports and that sort of stuff. So performing sort of came to me later. I always enjoyed like seeing performance and stuff. But I think as a teenager, uh, you know, you start to develop, you know, your sense of humor and all of that sort of thing. And um, the things you enjoy watching and like things that you're influenced by. And um, even then I would say it was more sort of private with my circle of friends, like trying to make each other laugh in the cafeteria. Like, um, but uh, then sometime in high school, I started to get uh, interested in it enough to want to take a class. Like there was some English electives that were like drama mm -hmm. and like children's theater stuff. And so I, that's when I kind of started doing it. I was probably like a sophomore or junior. And then I went out for the play junior year and got, in, more interested in it, um, but still not interested in enough. Like I didn't major in it. My degree is in rhetoric. Um, From so that, the University in Colorado, or what? What's Colorado, the Colorado the State Colorado University. The Colorado State University. Okay, and you got a degree in rhetoric. Uh, um, which that's correct. Seems like a far cry from comedy. Well, I could argue, one could argue, yes. uh, as anyone who, who uh, specializes in rhetoric can say that it isn't that far, especially because like uh, dealing in satire and like expression and having point of view, it could be, you know, the rhetoric is most simply defined as like the art of persuasion. So there is a certain amount of persuasion in rhetoric um, mm. or in satire, excuse me, but um, so anyways, yeah, I mean, I was mostly just making my friends laugh <laughs> and then got more involved in college. So like I was, uh, I had, I was very lucky to have amazing professors in college that really encouraged me, um, to learn more and to focus on the work. And that's when I got real interested in it. And then somewhere in college, I went back to Chicago where I'm originally from, like on a, on a break and I saw my first entire second city review and that's when i was like okay this is what i want to do i think that then it clicked and you went back to chicago and you started taking classes there mm -hmm. yeah and then got i graduated in. college and i immediately moved uh to chicago and started immersed myself in the the chicago improv scene and sketch and comedy scene as much as i could and how did your family respond to that were they supportive um you, they you just uh, got to school for 
an amount of time to study rhetoric and now you're going to comedy school. So how did that go? <laughs> yeah. Um, they've been very supportive. It was definitely out of the norm. Like uh, my family uh, is pretty blue collar, like humble family. So like I was, I was the first person in my immediate family to go to college, even though I have older sisters, my parent, neither of my parents went to college. So like they were happy that I got my education. I imagine that there was a certain amount of, you know, why didn't you go to law school? (laughs) You know, that sort of stuff. Um, But they were extremely supportive. And I think that they saw that I had success at it. Like they came and saw shows that I did and they recognized to some extent that I was okay at it. (laughs) And um, I don't think your parents, I I think your parents have like an, a a range in which they'll see you like you'll never if you're truly terrible they'll never see you as being truly terrible at something (laughs) but also if you're the best actor on the planet you're still their kid and they'll never necessarily recognize that you're the best actor on the planet so it's like somewhere in between there they felt um but yeah (laughs) they were pretty supportive in his in whatever way they could be so there wasn't like significant pushback on my decisions my grandmother would say like what what are you doing what's in demand is what she could oh, yeah, uh, yeah. ask a lot. Um, and that I would say, no, <laughs> I'm not. Uh, if I were in demand, I would be like working in IT or something like that. Yeah. Like that was what was in demand um, and continues to be. But um, yeah, so I went back and studied and did as much as I could. And um, they were very supportive. And then I was lucky to have some success relatively early on. Like I, I started making a living at it like pretty young, oh. like at like 24. So while still in Chicago, it wasn't like, yes. So I had like commercial success and I was doing, I was doing whatever I could, like, which is exactly what I'm doing now, which is mixing together whatever work comes my way to a certain extent. I, I mean, I like um, to call it hustling. Would, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it is truly a freelance life and we can get into that later. But like um yeah, so I had some success and earned my union cards early, like I was like twenty four, twenty five, so I had been lucky and fortunate in that regard. So when I started um taking improv in the early two thousands, the first time I took it, it had a really profound effect on my perspective on life. Um, Just the whole yes and philosophy of just sort of taking life, what life brings you and then adding to it with your own spin. Did did you experience something similar? Did improv affect not only your career, but also um, was there any mental, emotional shifts in your life that made you sort of grab the bull by the horns? Uh, Tell me about that transformation. Yeah, I think it it has informed my life. I don't know if I would say it it has driven my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it has informed my life philosophically. And going back to the roots of like rhetoric, rhetoric is like the education is like very academic and Mm -hmm. studying a lot of ancient Greek philosophy and stuff. So Mm -hmm. the philosophy of improv, which I really do enjoy, and as you said, it it probably has some version of a profound effect on me. certainly has an effect on me in the way that I collaborate, certainly had an effect on me in the way that I approach any work that I do, um, which is almost always ensemble based. And Mm. I just, I trust that it'll always be better with the group mind than the individual mind. Mm -hmm. Um, So I've been pretty fortunate in that regard. I don't know if it's like entirely informed everything because I'm, I come from a, like a long uh, list and, uh, family history of warriors and anxiety. <laughs> so like they're, I don't, I'm not sure. Like I'm like life. Yes. And like, yeah. I'm not that person either. I'm probably, I'm more calculated than that mm-hmm. with like every decision I do with in life. But I have to say, I can think of two things, which, uh, you know, refers to what you, you're doing on this show um, where yes. And certainly uh, uh, informed my life. The first was when my daughter was born, um, I was 
if it were the 1950s and like you could sit in the waiting room and drink gin and smoke <laughs> cigarettes, I would have done that. But like when she was born in 2011, that was not socially acceptable <laughs> and not the expectation yeah. of her dad. <laughs> Um, but I was like, people, my wife, who I love very much, I, I don't like seeing people I know and love in pain, and I don't love blood and guts. So I was like, you know, I'm going to offer the pers- the support that I can without being a distraction here in this room. Like, I do not want to make this about me and like pass out or something. Anyways, I loved the childbirth experience and our, our, our uh, doctor, like, during labor asked, do you want to deliver the baby? And I was like, sure. And that was like a total yes and thing. Like, I'm not going to be like, no. And next thing I knew, I was like getting ready to do it. And I did it. So I was like very in the moment. Yeah. And if you asked me if I would have, if I would have elected to do that beforehand, I would have said 10 times out of 10, no, thank you. But in that moment, I said, yes. And because of that, you had and a I'm tremendously sorry. profound experience. That's so great. Yeah. I was the first human to touch my daughter. Like That's ob- crazy. obviously outside of, outside of being inside my <laughs> Outside <laughs> of being inside the other human's body. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Sure. Sure. So talk- um, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And then with my son who we adopted, but we adopted through foster care he was the, we had just got uh, certified as foster parents in Los Angeles County. And he was the very first call we received for foster placement. And they literally, the call is like, we have name and like very little information, potentially the race of the child, the age of the child, and kind of anything else they know. It takes about seven seconds for them to tell you all they know about the kid. And then they say, you have 15 minutes to decide. Oh, wow. Now you're prepared for that when you're in foster certification class because they can't like let let, wait for you to hem and haw all day because if you're a no, they got to move down the list. Yeah. So, um, in that moment, my my normal operating, you know, mo modus operandi would be have to been like really consider it, think about it, worry about it. But in that moment, I knew we had a short amount of time. It was the very first call we had, and I just my wife and I discussed and I knew she was a yes, like from, she was very enthusiastic the whole time and she wanted to do it so badly. And I was kind of cautiously optimistic. I was like, yeah, let's do it. And I'm so thankful that I did. So that's two times in my life where yes. And brought me to the moment where I sort of didn't live it cautiously. And I'm so thankful that I did do what I did. And I love that it's uh, both having to do with your children who are I mean when you have kids there's it's hard not to yes and because they're so so unpredictable so much of the time that sometimes you just gotta you gotta learn to roll with it unless you don't but (laughs) that can get tricky well yeah I mean I think again that is how people operate in a certain thing I think children do thrive in some version of structure but we also can't we can't always assume that that structure will always exist or not break down or, or it may not be what your child needs at that moment. Right. So I think there is a little bit of like having to understand and have some emotional intelligence that goes beyond just like, this is the plan. Right. Uh, I remember when mine were super tiny and just as soon as we got some method to work for soothing or sleep or whatever it was, it stopped working. As soon as we got into the routine and, you know, the structure, mm. okay, this is what we're going to do. It just stopped working. And then when you have an, this, the second kid, like nothing that worked on the first works on the second, you got to start over. So you got to, yeah. you got to definitely stay flexible for sure. So tell me um, when you were starting out doing your improv and learning this new life philosophy, tell me when it started to really click for you that this was a career that you wanted to pursue and a life style that you wanted to continue doing rather than just, okay, this is fun. Let's go get a, a real job. What, what made you want to stick with it in the long haul, that early success or. Um, yeah, I think that, and those early days in Chicago everything felt like progression, like it was a step in the right direction, you know, completing in, you know, a program, graduating from another, you know, comedy school, you know, getting more stage time, 
getting more auditions, booking work, like all of those things felt like progression and, and building mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. Um, I do recall like feeling pretty all in on it pretty early. Um, I still had like a couple jobs, like serving jobs or bartending jobs, mm-hmm. but I was able to like quit those pretty quickly. Like mm. I, I, I served for a couple years post-college. Like I said, like, I think I stopped when I was like 25 or something. Mm. Um, I didn't need, you know, the supplemental income or a flexible job that allowed, like I started doing okay enough to kind of live on it. But mm-hmm. it felt like it was building. Um, I certainly had a goal to try to work at Second City. So like that was a thing in Chicago mm-hmm. um, to kind of work towards like, auditioning for their touring company, which they, since it's an equity theater company, they had yearly auditions, Mm -hmm. yearly generals. Mm -hmm. Uh, And sometimes they had more than that, but sometimes they didn't like, um, so yeah, it all felt like progression. I was also lucky enough to the first place I lived in Chicago was a four bedroom apartment with three other guys who were all other actors, Mm -hmm. uh, which could seemingly seem like a nightmare, but it was actually a really supportive, uh, environment. Mm -hmm. Um, we, we certainly drank a lot and enjoyed our lives. We were in our early 20s and stuff. Um, we probably could have worked more. I was just joking with them and saying, if we, if we had any, like, any work ethic to write more then, you know, it may have turned into something. Right. That, totally. that probably a lot more time messing around. But, um, yeah, I, I was very fortunate to have a good, uh, like, a good community, the support of my family, uh, my family couldn't offer like financial support. Like I've noticed in Los Angeles, there's a fair amount of like, if there isn't nepotism, there's like a rich family behind them. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that's certainly a safety net. Like I didn't, my family just couldn't offer that financial support. So they, they gave that support and being like amazing audience members and coming to shows and, and asking questions and being excited for me and enthusiastic for my successes. And so it was after um, that, I mean, that, I think that that, that's huge too. And it was after you um, were a a touring member at Second City in Chicago that you got cast as a cast member or got the, as a cast member for Mad Mad TV and then moved to LA. Was that how that worked or? It it was after that, but I also was, so you, there's like a whole system at Second City that we could spend a million years talking about. But um, essentially, I went, I was in the touring company for a couple of years, which was an amazing experience. But then I was promoted to the resident company um, in Chicago. And so that okay. means you, you perform on the resident company stage in Chicago. You no longer tour. The difference is, is you, the performer is the writer and the writer is the performer. So, mm. and it becomes, um, you know, it's your job, you get insurance through equity, it's, mm-hmm. it's your gig, um, though, that, you know, you still have some flexibility to do other jobs, uh, acting jobs and stuff. Mm-hmm. But um, so I was doing the resident company when I was hired by Mad TV. So they had come and seen shows and then had auditions in Chicago. And then I was flown to uh, Los Angeles. And did you feel like, audition. did you feel like you had, had made it at that point or it was just another uh, step on that progressive ladder that you were working through? Just well, another rung, you know, as one does. No, <laughs> it was a tough one. It was a tough time because I felt a great deal of pressure. I was also oh. flown to New York for SNL um, and like had a four hour meeting at SNL and like, spent a lot of time there with like Tina Fey and Amy Poehler and Lauren Michaels. Like it was weird, but I didn't audition. I was flown there. But at that point I had already auditioned for mad TV. There was like a whole lot of things going on at that particular time Uh because I had a, I had a development deal, a development deal with Sony pictures television that I was under contract with them. So technically at that point I was still, my time, my efforts were owned by Sony Pictures Television. Oh. So that was like a big wrinkle and everything. Anyways, it was a really weird time. I did not feel like I made it. I was actually, I, I, um, 
I was very worried that I made the wrong decision. Oh. And if I'm being completely honest, I think I did. Oh. Um, but it was, you get caught up in it and like, I'm happy for every opportunity that I've had, but um, they, they, you know, you try to be humble about it and be quiet about like stuff. And they're like trying to tell you like, like, this is how long ago it was. <laughs> I, I got a call from the talent people at SNL saying, hi, you know, this is so-and-so from SNL. Can you please send us a tape? A tape? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you send us a tape of some scenes? Um, and we're going to be there next week to see your show. But please don't tell anybody. So for like a week, no pressure. I knew that the people were coming. Oh, yeah, gosh. <laughs> and I shouldn't say anything to anybody. So that was weird. But then when I flew there and I flew to Mad TV, everybody in like the Chicago community knew I had a, my agent in Chicago was like, this is a, this is a real nightmare, like logistically and legally mm. because of my contract with Sony and all of this stuff. Um, so I got a manager in LA and my manager in LA was like, well, all I know is you need to be on a TV show this fall. And you start to believe the hype. Yeah. The worst case scenario at that point was if I don't do either of those jobs, I still live two blocks from second city and I continue to do a job that I absolutely love doing. And I wasn't anywhere near being done doing like I left because another job, like a TV opportunity came. I can't be like, I'm going to stay here for theater. You guys <laughs> like you go like th yeah. this is the time. Right. So uh, to answer your question, it did not feel like I had made it. I felt like I had made an enormous mistake. Mm. Um, but I also felt like one of the part of the decision making process is nobody hopes with love in my heart for Mad TV and SNL, which are both amazing gigs and a mm. lot of amazing talented people have worked there. Nobody hopes to end your career there. You hope to start your career there. Yeah. And television. Right. Like, it's 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 a step to something else even snl which is right. like the top of the mountain for anybody as a sketch comedian sure. could be but if that's your last gig that's a bummer and, and did you, <laughs> you know? did you feel like it was or were you worried that it would be did you think that that was that that could it, that could uh, just be it and you go back or well i mean oddly enough i did like my after my first season at mad one of my best friends had gotten moved up. There's two resident companies in Chicago is ETC and main stage. He had gotten moved up to main stage and the way TV schedule works, you essentially work August well, at traditional TV schedule. It's different now. Yeah. It depends on this show, but traditional TV schedule is roughly July or August to February, March. Mm. So I had from basically end of February until August off. And my wife was had a job in Chicago, so I actually didn't move to LA my first season on Mad TV. Oh. I sort of flew back and forth when oh. we were in production. So I went and understudied for him for like six weeks, <laughs> and I because he moved up, and I I did theater for six weeks because I was like I don't have anything to do, um, and I loved it. It was so fun. The only bummer was I wasn't doing the show with him. I was doing the show in in his place. <laughs> um, right, but. Yeah, I don't know if I felt like I made it. I mean, I was certainly excited. People were super excited. I was excited to see what was next. And there was lots of things and uncertainty. But I don't know. I'm, I am I look back and I've had amazing opportunities. And I look uh, like I feel very fortunate for the career that I've had. But I have never felt like I, I made it. Yeah. You're just always hustling still. Yeah, I think that that's part of the work, unfortunately. Yeah, and I wonder if even people at the, at the top ranks, who, who, I wonder if anybody ever feels like they've made it and they can just sit back. I mean, I'm sure some people do, but I think for most of the people that are like actual working with the intention of the craft, they feel like they have to keep working. Would you, yeah, would and you unfortunately, agree? Los Angeles, yeah, they it makes you want more. Like, yeah. It, so, for example, the Emmy nominations came out today, right? And I know tons of people. Like, I'm so happy for those people. That's incredible, right? Mm. But like, it's like if you get a pilot, yay! I got a pilot. Now you want that pilot to go to series. Oh, now it's on series. It's going well. You wanted to get another season, and now you want to get an Emmy nomination, and now you want to get an Emmy win. Like. 
it's never enough. You're always chasing like, something. There's a million stories of people at SNL. They got the gig. They have no idea where they stand mm -hmm. on that show mm -hmm. every year when they're up for renewal, which is like right now, July is the time where everyone's finding out if their contract's getting renewed. Mm. Nobody knows. I mean, even Kristen Wiig talked about it. It's like, Kristen Wiig, you were the star of the show when you were on the show. And mm -hmm. she's saying, like in interviews, yeah, I didn't know if I was going to get another year. Mm. It's like, come on. But that's all our own insecurity. And, un yeah. you know, maybe that place breeds that. But I think that that's just kind of industry wide. Yeah. So I, I, I like the pursuit of any creative person to continue to drive. Like you shouldn't ever rest and you should continue to push and evolve and grow. But it, it also, <laughs> there's also, a, it's, I wish there were a point where you were like, okay, I feel pretty good about this, but I have never once been content, you know, for any great period of time. Well, that's a little reassuring. Period. I'm going to be honest with you. It's a little reassuring because I mean, I, I look and I'm like, there's gotta be at some point it's gotta be like, Oh, this is great. But I mean, if you're always striving for that, um, maybe not. It comes at a sacrifice. Some of the most successful people that I know, and I would say I'm, I know people that are really successful. Mm -hmm. It has come at a sacrifice of yeah. something. And, and, you know, you know, it's very like first world privilege powers mm -hmm. or, uh, 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 first word privilege problems to have, right. <laughs> but um, it doesn't mean that it's easy in every single way. Um, I would love to have those problems. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, tell me, tell me about some of uh, the challenges that you have faced in balancing your uh, home life, your busy family life with your work schedule I think when I met you you were touring or you were about to go on tour or something to that effect with um some show and so mm -hmm. you're on the road a lot how or you were before the pandemic at least so how do you balance all of that tell me the challenges that come as in your in your world and how you make it all work well, I have like the most supportive wife on the planet who is incredibly uh, emotionally supportive and uh, helps me like make decisions and what's best for our family and that sort of stuff. And she almost always is for whatever, like most jobs that are offered, mm -hmm. not because of the money, but she, she knows I would like doing it or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I'm, um, you know, cautious to a certain extent that particular gig you're talking about was like a, a, a significant sort of long tour mm -hmm. which i try not to do anymore i'm sort of done with that like um having said that i next month at the end of august i'm going to chicago for two months to direct for second city but that that like even that i'm sort of just I'm so excited to do it but i'm sort of dreading it as a parent yeah. and as a human yeah um but it was nice to hear this. I just heard this story. Bob Odenkirk was talking about Better Call Saul. Uh, and when they, he was approached by the people at AMC to do it, that he had great difficulty because he just didn't, because they shoot in Albuquerque mm -hmm. and he lives in Los Angeles. His wife is a manager, a talent manager. Mm -hmm. His kids are, were school age at that point. And he's like, I just don't know if I want to go to Albuquerque for four months. Mm -hmm. Like, and be away from them. And so his, as the story goes, he said something like on a Friday, I told my manager, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm out. And over the weekend, his kids and his wife were talking to him and like sort of brought him around to the idea of like, we'll make it work. We'll, we'll talk on the phone. We'll FaceTime. We'll visit. You'll come back when you can. Like, we really want to support you doing this thing, which mm -hmm. I thought was really cool. Cause yeah. it, to a certain extent, it is a family effort Absolutely. and there's a sacrifice. And so, you know, he, uh, I think he said he called his manager on Sunday or on Monday and said like, um, you know, I talked with my family about it and now I'm considering it more. And the, his manager said something to the extent of like, well, good news. They just came back and they want to offer you more money. And it wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't trying to like, 
like play hardball. Right. He was tr- tr- like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be gone. This isn't about money. So he's like, it was win win because he's like, I wasn't even trying to get more money, and I did. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just like as the human. So I think it's really tough, and I yeah. can see why there are more actors that pursue it in their twenties and there are less that do it in their thirties and less that do it in their forties and so on. Like, mm-hmm. because as you try to build it, it, it's a terrible life for family in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, it's incredibly flexible and that's cool, but it's, ah, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's incredibly difficult. And so my role has kind of vacillated. Um, there have been times where I'm like the primary caregiver at home. Like mm-hmm. my wife is working because I just don't have consistent enough income. Um, and then there are times where I'm out on the road or there are times that I, you know, I'm working more and like, we may have somebody helping us, but like, there has been no consistency to that. Like mm. in my daughter's life, she's 10 years old. There have been times where I'm the predominant worker. I'm the predominant pri- caregiver. <laughs> like it's changed so much. Like, um, so it just, it's all over the place. But I think that's, uh, you know, great for kids to see that you can mix it up and play both sides. And, it, you know, it, it does take a village and it's good for kids, oh, I think, yeah. to learn that trust and to lean on that village. Um, t- tell me how the pandemic was for you with your kids. Um, work slow down for all of us, I think. And then we were all um, homeschooling and that sort of thing. So tell me how that influenced and affected you this past year. Yeah, I think like everybody, there's a certain amount of suffering. Mine's no more, no less than anybody else's. I mean, there were lots of people died and were more greatly affected by it. Um, I have been like personally affected by it. uh, But for the most part, I feel like I've, been all right um and my family's all right and that's Mm kind of what's most important um it had its challenges you know oddly enough we my wife was in grad school um and just graduated last may so during that time we had made a decision to kind of downsize because we knew she was going to be in grad school full time and not earning money and mine my income has been so inconsistent so we moved to a family housing on campus of the university that she was at, oh. which is the smallest place I've lived in wow. since I was in college. Like it's a really long time. The only difference is now it was two adults, two children and a dog. We had a bunch of, we put a bunch of stuff in uh, storage and said, we knew this was going to be temporary, but like it just sort of eased the financial burden. Yeah. Little did we know when we moved in that we would be, Confined. staying there so much. Oh, wow. Um, so it, it ended up, the fortunate thing is, is we live in Los Angeles. There's, you can spend time outside every single day. So like we, there were people that had it much worse than I, mm-hmm. but it was just sort of funny. Like, oh, this is the place. Like we had to make a decision at some point. It's like, do we want to have a dining room table or a space for the kids to learn? <laughs> so we got rid of the dining room table when it became very apparent that the kids were going to be doing school from home. So we, we replaced it with a desk and like their supplies and stuff. So we did without a dining room table for over a year. Um, But did you get the dining room table back? We sold it. Oh, you did. Okay. We got a new one. We, we moved to a new place uh, last month or in May. Um, And so we have much more room and that's wonderful. (laughs) Uh, I'm trying to think, yeah, I was really impressed by my kids' resilience yeah. and flexibility. Like it was a weird time for everybody, but I'm I'm so impressed by them. It, it was not easy to be in tight quarters. It was not the perfect, you know, learning environment, I'm sure as you know with kids. But they did really well. I, I'm proud of them um and how they did and, and work pretty much disappeared for me uh for a long time. There's stuff that came back and some I was fortunate to have some work like I did, um, I'll send, I should send you a link. Um, I did a PSA for like the ad council about fatherhood Mm. that I didn't even realize, but they essentially took my 
auditioned recording and created a VO and I gave them a bunch of pictures and videos that they cut together to make the commercial. Oh. Like, and that really helped like financially when it came in and stuff. Yeah. Um, but like, there was some work here and there. Second city had some stuff that they were trying to do online and like pivot to new stuff. So, and I was fortunate to be a part of some of that. Um, but it, it feels like things are picking back up and, mm. You know, there have been more auditions and I've, I've shot a couple things in recent times. So that on a set, like with, you know, obviously with COVID restrictions and stuff, but um, there, I mean, getting back to whatever normal is in 2021. How do you manage to still create and do what you do best, which is all the comedy and all the funny when you are going through challenges, uh, emotional challenges, losing loved ones, being confined to a small space with small children, having to teach homeschool, um, the socio-cultural unrest that we've all experienced the past couple of years. What do you do to find your own space, to stay focused and to create um, this really funny stuff that you create. Tell me your process with that. Well, it took a while to get back. Um, I, I was, you sort of like, at first you sort of hunker down and just like try to survive, like, yeah. you know, whatever that is. Like, it's not like, oh, I gotta do a show. I need to do a show right now. Like, at the point that it was all happening, everyone was just trying to figure out what the heck was going on and how we're going to survive this. Right. Um, but then as the months went on, I think there was like a progression. I mean, I was thinking about like last summer, this time a year ago ish, maybe more in June or whatever. I was like staying up every night and just playing video games. Like I hadn't done that since I was like in my early twenties. Like I was just like clearly depressed in some way. Yeah. And like waiting to let me go to bed. And then I would just sit there till two in the morning and play video games. It was like <laughs> the only thing that like sort of took me away from everything. Yeah. It was not constructive. Um, but then I started to try to do some things. Like uh, I was totally unsuccessful, but I tried to create a fake ad agency that made like satirical ads. Um, and that sort of fizzled out over a few months, but like I was trying to bring different people together and like um, create that. And then I started taking writing classes oh. uh, in the summer, like late summer last year, because there were so many places that were offering classes that I wouldn't normally have been able to take. Um, I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to submit a packet for late night with Stephen Colbert and I had never done that before. Mm. So I was like, oh, I should take a class on that. I, I, I did it backwards because I took the class <laughs> after I actually submitted the packet. But I was like, it would be fun to know more about this. And so I took a class uh, and then that sparked me taking more classes. And so then I started developing and working on a, a semi-autobiographical pilot, um, which really helped like do something creative during yeah. this time. So. I just, I finished it in like June and like there's been tons of revisions and stuff, but uh, last fall I started working on it and I'm like getting, you know, weeks away from trying to like send it out and pitch it. So that felt really good. Um, it was hard to do because as I said before, I'm a collaborator and I prefer ensemble, but my reality was my reality and being in class helped me be accountable to like do the work and to turn it in and to get feedback. And um, it, it set some sort of routine and process for me during that time, which was an adjusted sort of thing anyways, because normally my work would be being in a room with people and working on it and then doing it in front of an audience or something like that. So I sort of, as we all did, had to pivot and be flexible. And, and this is your first pilot that you've written, right? It started in this class. First pilot I've written alone, yes. Alone. So I've written a couple others, and I developed another a couple years ago that we didn't sell, but we had, like, we took to a lot of cool places, and it would have been, it would, I'm so sad it didn't sell. It was such a great idea. Um, uh, 
that we, my friend Ithamar, uh, who's an amazing performer and one of my best friends, I had directed his solo show and he did a one man silent show. And we developed that into a web series that Key and Peel produced that was on Disney Digital. And then we took that to a TV idea that we partnered with 4 by 2 Films, which is Sasha Baron Cohen's production company. Mm -hmm. uh, and we took it out and we unfortunately didn't sell it, but that was all with him, with the team. So this I was see. the first time that I was like doing it. This is alone, like me like no one else to Log work with <laughs> just showing yeah, it was up pretty and daunting. doing the work and yeah, yeah. but uh, we'll see we'll see what it goes because you know completing the work is so different than like now the business of like trying to sell it um so we'll see how that goes and so do you shoot a pilot before you try to sell it like can you do it yourself to get it or, Some or, are people you, do. or you just do the script what are, what's your plot what's your plan every i mean everybody does you know, there's many ways to that, you know, mm. um, we, in this particular one, I do not plan to shoot it. I plan to sell the script and the idea. That's where I'm at now. Catch me, you know, if we've gotten a thousand <laughs> no's, then we'll be like, I'm shooting it myself. You yeah. know? All depends. I mean, there's so many different ways now that shows get created. It could be from a web series. I mean, depending on who it come from, it can come from a sheet of paper of an mm -hmm. idea, you know, like, Ted Lasso was a promo for NBC Sports. Like, that's where it started. Oh, uh, okay. Like, the character existed in, like, 2013. Sure. Like, so, like, you never know where it comes from. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, my main plan there is to uh, sell it. There's different schools of thoughts, and, like, everybody has, like, their own way of going about it. So, like, with the show that Ithamar and I collaborated on, we did not write a pilot for that. We had done a web series. So we had like this amazing package that we had already shot mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it looked great. And it was an amazing sizzle reel of like 90 seconds to show people. And then we, we more focused on the strength of the pitch mm -hmm. um, and not the script. Also knowing because we have a main character that is silent. <laughs> um, it was basically the idea is like, it was kind of um, the, America seen through the eyes of a mute immigrant mm. and Ithamar is an extremely talented physical performer. I think like, he's like our generation's Mr. Bean, um, which has like Mr. Bean. This is another thing. Mr. Bean's Facebook fan page has like 77 million likes. Wow. Taylor Swift's Facebook fan page has 75 million likes. The only difference is Mr. Bean hasn't done any new material in 20 plus years. <laughs> So somebody in the world likes physical comedy. Yeah. I just think in America, maybe not so much. <laughs> Anyways, um, so our thought was like, we didn't want to write a pilot for that. Sell the show and then we'll write a pilot because it may not translate if it's action driven. Mm -hmm. So like people have different things. Like I've known other people that shoot pilot presentations. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you want to do, there is a, a certain level of like, do it yourself. But then there's other schools of thought that would say like, okay, if it's, it might be too baked. Like if you don't want it to be fully baked because the network or the production company wants to have some sort of creative say. Right. So some of the time you, you lose out on that collaboration if you're turning in a shot pilot. But like right. I have friends who created the show Work in Progress that's on Showtime. It's an amazing show. If you've never seen it or heard of it, it's so good. Uh, it's a, an amazing improviser named Abby McEnany who I was on a team with at IO many years ago. She's one of the funniest people on the planet created a show that was, it's like so perfectly and uniquely her, but they, they put it together and they shot it. And, and that probably helped them immensely because then they took it to Sundance, which is normally films, but now there's television involved. Mm. And then they got other things involved and then they sold the series to Showtime. So like, there's so many different paths. Yeah. Wow. That's great. Well, I cannot wait to see yours and how it works out for you. And we'll I'm, I'm yeah. rooting. I'm rooting for you over here, and can't wait Thank to you. to keep keep us all posted. I I think we've gone through all of my questions. Some you answered without even asking. So you're you're oh. you're a great guest. You just kind of you know intuitively oh. knew where to take it. So that was fantastic. Um, 
Is there anything that you want to talk about, maybe, that I didn't cover? Uh, your start in, in the industry or um, any uh, awesome stories mm. you want to share or not so awesome <laughs> stories you want to share or anything um, at all? Well, no, I mean, I think that like, because I mean, you're, you're really focusing a lot of this is about that work-life balance, especially for creative folks, right? Like, I think work-life balance is difficult no matter what your career is, right? right. But the difference with, with creative folks is it's really hard to find the time on when you clock in and when you clock out. Mm. And I think one thing that I sort of have been able to dodge and been very fortunate is I've never had to clock in and clock out. Mm. But with that comes the instability of like, cause those, those folks that clock in and clock out, they also know what that check looks like every two weeks. Right. And they, and they, there's like a certain amount of like planning you can do. And like, I think that that becomes very difficult when you have a family. Um, so you have to have an amazing partner and you have to have, you know, kids that sort of can roll with it because the routine and structure isn't always going to be the exact same. Right. Granted, my, I've tried to get my kids to come wherever I am for at least a period of time when I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. And I get a lot of random Tuesday afternoons with my kids, which a lot of people that work every day don't. Mm -hmm. So like it is a trade-off and a sacrifice. And so I would just to encourage anybody that's living that artist life, like we know it's hard and like we recognize that. And hopefully there's ebbs and flows to it and there's ways that you can enjoy it um, that freedom, uh, and you may sacrifice a little bit of stability for that freedom sometimes, but, um, I think, you know, you catch everybody on a different time and on a different day, you know, we all feel a little differently as to what it might be. Like my feeling lately has been like, Oh, like if somebody, have you seen the movie sound of metal? No, but I've seen the trailer. It's in my watch list. Okay, it's really good. I'm not spoiling anything. If I, it's, Riz Ahmed's performance is amazing. It's essentially about a, a drummer who loses his hearing. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've spoiled anything for yeah. you. But it really, I connected to it as an artist of like, what if they took away your ability to do the thing you love the most, mm -hmm. right? Or what if I willingly said, if I, if I could quit right now doing this and I could, I could, I could say it, but I'm guaranteed a decent living with a paycheck every two weeks mm -hmm. for the next, however many years till I retire. There are times in this last year or so where I'm like, I might take that one because at least I know what to expect. Yeah. It would be incredibly difficult and I don't know how I would turn, but there's some of the time I'm like, if I just said, this is what I do and that's that, because every once in a while you look at the end of the year and you have, you know, 12 W2s and 10, 1099s <laughs> and you're like, what did I, I don't even know what I made this year. Was it a good year or not? <laughs> like you're that can get tiresome as well. So like, I feel like as you get older and your, and your life progresses, it can be very difficult to balance those things. So why do you say anything? What keeps you doing it and not getting that nine to five. Why do you do it? Cause I'm horribly unqualified to really do anything else. A couple of years ago I applied at Costco and I didn't get a call. Like I've applied for other jobs. I'm really incapable of other work. Like I'm just there not are, able to. Do surely there's something else. There's other things I'm sure I could do. I have not necessarily gone down that road too much because I am compelled to a certain extent to do the work. Like, but yeah, I think about it, you know, weekly. But I don't compelled, really know. But compelled by what? That's what I, that's what I want to know. What, what keeps because you here? What has are, kept you here for all these years since college? Uh, Cause I'm, I'm talented and I'm good mm -hmm. at it. And it's a hard job to do. There are less talented people more successful than I am. Yeah. And that's frustrating as shit, yeah. but that's yeah. the business. Yeah. Um, so 
Um, and, and it isn't um, my, I don't have, it's not any sort of race with them, but there is like, it's a business and it, it's not a meritocracy and life is not. Mm. So that pursuit, I, I don't know what else I would do. I, I do, I'm doing what I think I am meant to do mm. and I can create. And I think, um, but sometimes you sort of accept the acceptance of your position and your, your, your current condition may not be your destiny, but at some point you want to take some sort of control of that destiny. Mm -hmm. And I feel like many times um, you feel at the whim of where the business is going to take you. So taking control of that. One example would just be like, I live in Los Angeles because I think I have to, because that's where work is. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. that already is a mental constraint to say I'm living in a place that I think I have to live in. And having said that Los Angeles is a lovely place to live. Um, but it's not a cheap place to live. And then mm -hmm. if you're informed by this idea that like, I'm not choosing to live here, I have to live here. <laughs> right. That sort of invades you, you know, yeah. the way that, you know, in the film, my dinner with Andre, they, they refer to New York city as the world's largest prison <laughs> is people love it so much that they think they can't get out. Right. And so um, I think about it frequently. I, I am truly not qualified to do much else. I'm extremely qualified to create comic material and perform comic material. And now I just need a gatekeeper to say, Hey, you can do it. That's the thing yeah. that I think is very tough is like the thing that I love the most performing and creating material requires someone else permission to do it. Right. That's right. a bummer. If somebody else loves kayaking, no one else has to ask them mm. if I can go kayaking. They just buy a kayak, they put it on top of their Subaru, and they go to the river and kayak. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've had conversations just like that with my husband, who is a musician, and he can just play whenever he wants. They can put up a show, and it's it's just different. And we've had those conversations about how it's my field particularly requires somebody else's permission way more than many other art forms, just like you said. So that is well, and it, well I'm sure he probably pushes back on that as well, <laughs> where he's like, well, I don't get to play wherever I want to. Like, there's still some rules to this, <laughs> but like, I mean, it depends. <laughs> I always had this fantasy of like, if, if you were Elvis Costello, could you walk in any bar anywhere sit down and be like, do you mind if I play a set? And they'll be like, sure, Elvis Costello. Like, yeah. You know? um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that that's part of it too. Like I've been thinking a lot about that. Like the other thing is, is you can, right? You mm -hmm. can, you are free to create, you know, this is an HD camera mm -hmm. and I can, I can, I have editing software. I can create, but can I monetize that? Can I create with any production level? Like, those are other things. And do I want to be in the very even playing field of the internet, you right. know? So like, there's all these questions of like how you can do it. So there's nothing that's necessarily precluding me from creating. There's things that preclude me from monetizing that work, yes. <laughs> you yes. know? Um, yes. Cause I, I, I respect the hustle, but I also like have been, I'm at a place in my career is like, I have a TikTok account. I have never done a single video. Yeah, me too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I could create, but why do I want to get in that hustle of like creating, <laughs> you know, at this point, yeah. I probably will cut to, cut to me like doing TikTok dances. And stuff. <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? Like you, it depends on where you at. I'm not saying I'm better than that because some of that work is amazing. And like the editing is amazing and super creative, Right. but it's like, okay, have I put in my time for internet comedy, Right. non-paying internet comedy? Right. And, and, and for me, you know, having kids that have to have stuff paid for is also a huge consideration. Like you can't just take any job or you can't just do TikTok for hours and hours because you have bills to pay. You have things to do. I mean, you know, like you said, some people have family support or, you know, a spouse that makes enough, but my husband's an entrepreneur and a musician and he also has a philosophy degree. So, you know, we're, we're both in the hustle. <laughs> you know? yeah. We're both hustling. So, 
we, those are all just where are we going to put our time and energy that's going to have the biggest you know return on investment because we got people depending on us right well i think that you landed on a really good point is where do you put your time and energy when I was referring back to starting out, it was sort of like my time and my energy was everywhere. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was spent on like fooling around, drinking, drinking, messing with my friends, you know, but now I have less of that time. So I need to be really focused and targeted with that. Mm -hmm. I I don't want to, I would never ever want to create the perception that I think that my kids have done anything to hurt my career. Right. They have changed the way that I look at time Mm. and the BS that I can and can't deal with, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I would say they've also inspired and motivated me to want to work. I just can't do everything. So like a friend was telling me, he's like on on a podcast, he was like, it feels like your cup is always full. And I said, it, well, it kind of is. I have two kids and a wife and I'm trying to make a living. Like it is. Um, he's like, you know, he's like, does that, is that true? And I was like, yeah, you know, <laughs> for the most part. But I also, I, I can't indulge every single thing. Like I can't do every single thing. Like I have to pick the things that I want to do and be really measured in that regard. Mm-hmm. So as you said, picking the right things putting the energy. So like writing this pilot is something I've wanted to do for years. So I'm to a certain extent, I'm thankful I had the time to mm-hmm. do it and I use that energy. But at this point, it, it is completely on spec. Like I, I have not been paid. I'm right. I'm, but it could lead to something. And I'm really happy because now it's tangible. It's an ex- a script that you can hold and read. Right. So how we spend our time and energy to me, that felt like I was like, okay, I could try to get involved on some zoom improv shows (laughs) or I could spend these couple hours every week writing. But then when I finish, I'll have something. And as much as I love improvising, I love it so much. I was like, I want to put my creative energy here for now. I can't wait to do an improv show in a theater, which I have not done in a really long time. Yeah. Totally, totally different than on Zoom. And really, that's the whole crux of where I am with this show. That's where, I mean, that's, it's not monetized because we're, I'm just building it, but it's so much more gratifying to put my energy here than where I was putting it and getting paid to put it, which was not fun. It was a mm-hmm. ed- editing petroleum engineering books, which is not creatively gratifying. So that's where mm-hmm. I am with the show. And I'm just putting it out there and hoping that it leads to other things, but. Well, also I feel like hopefully like just you and I talking now is good for our soul to just connect yeah. on like being a parent and, and balancing life. Like, uh, are you familiar with the Buddhist monk tip, not Han? No. He's pretty awesome. No? He, um, I feel like I can several books. I feel like I can see the name written out more than I know. It's H-I-C-H-N-H-A-T-H-A-N-H-A-N. His name is Thich Nhat Hanh. He's, he's amazing. He wrote this book called Be Here Now. And it's like, it's, there's so many, like you can draw a straight line from improv philosophies to these things. But there's one thing that he talks about that I, th- I found very interesting called the compassion of suffering. Mm. And this idea um, of he puts it in a very specific way, essentially saying like, you know, somebody says to you how they're feeling and you don't have to fix their problem or give them a solution. You just have to connect to to say that you have heard that Mm. they are suffering. So Mm. to say like, my dear, I'm sorry, you are suffering because of blank. And I think this could potentially be your compassion of suffering is like Mm. you're connecting to people on like how this balance and like, where does this, where does this put me and how do I make it all work? but having the opportunity to hear other people talk about the things that you are connecting to and the struggles that you're having is part of the therapy to hopefully get you to somewhere better. Yes. And, and hopefully for anybody watching too, to also hear the same thing and feel the same connection and can get them to a better place to 
inspire them or move them or any any way to ease suffering yeah. for anybody else well i just want to so, say i know you said you were out of questions like 10 minutes ago or something <laughs> but thank you for doing it and i think it's a really important thing i think there's it's it is a hard thing and i don't know if you have a solvable thing that you could say like this is how we fix this right. but like i think that there it's a really all artists are on some sort of journey and we're mm. we're constantly finding where we are in that journey and that's and, and, and evolving and changing as artists and where our life brings us and that, i think that's all really cool um and you know the improv part of us the improviser in us would say like we need to consistently be adaptive mm. so as you said as the world changes hopefully for the better it may hurt a little bit now and we're all learning and trying to exist in the world and re-enter the world i also think with that flexibility and as things change as parents as humans we will get better i love that and i'm going to i'm going to end it on that because i don't think i could wrap it up any any better or more succinctly or more profoundly so thank you <laughs> I'm uh, calling from my stepdad's office in Arkansas, everybody. Here's his, <laughs> here's his golf awards. I mean, just the power that comes from Arkansas. Just the profound mm -hmm. revelation. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me, for talking to me and sharing a little bit about your journey and all the things that you've learned and, and muddled through and overcome and balanced and all of that. I am so grateful that you showed up and um, sat in and talked with me for a while. And, and thank you to all of you who are watching, who are still along for the ride as well. Um, like and subscribe, and I will have all of Frank's links down at the bottom so you can connect with him and get to know more about his work and what he's doing and stay in the loop for when his pilot comes out. And thanks again for joining us today on the Artist Collective radio show.